Okay, so let me just, uh, I, I want to be uh, a little bit more technical about the definition of information complexity, and this is something that Mark mentioned at the end of his part. So uh, this is the way that we defined the information cost of a protocol. We're given a protocol pi. Uh, big pi is a random variable representing the transcript of this protocol. The randomness here comes both from the input distribution mu and from the internal randomness of the protocol itself. And then we're going to measure how much, uh, so this is how much Bob learns. He knows Y and he's learning about X. And the other term is how much Alice is learning about Y, uh, given X, which he already knows, from observing the transcript of the protocol. So the first thing I would like to do, which Mark already mentioned, is get rid of the public randomness. Okay, so I would like to assume that my protocols do not have access to public randomness. What if they wanted to have public randomness? Well, they can always generate it by just having Alice take some, a chunk of her private randomness and send it over to Bob. And in terms of information complexity, this actually doesn't add any information cost um, because this uh, randomness has nothing to do with the input, right? So uh, this is what we're going to be assuming from now on. And just to see it, this is the uh, new transcript of the protocol. I'm going to make Alice take a chunk of private randomness and send it to Bob, and then she will send whatever she wanted to send before, and the conversation will proceed like before. Uh, what is now, what is uh, Bob going to learn? Well, just you know, trivial chain rule. Um, it's whatever he learns from the randomness about x plus whatever he learns from the transcript. But from the randomness, he learns nothing about x because it's independent. So we get exactly the same information cost that we had before. So this is just one of the two terms up here, but the other one is the same. OK, so from now on, I'll be dropping the public randomness everywhere. All right, so uh, I want to show you one of the uh, key ingredients in the theorem that Mark pointed out, which is that information cost is the scaling limit of communication as the number of copies goes to infinity. And this ingredient is the fact that information cost tensorizes. So if I want to solve n copies of the same problem, I will have to pay exactly n times as much. So formally, this is the statement. Let's fix some function from inputs to some output. And this actually doesn't need to be a function. It can be any sort of communication task. And let's define the task of solving n copies of the function with marginal error epsilon on each one of the uh, copies. OK, so I don't need to solve all the copies simultaneously. I just want to be solving each one with probability uh, and most, uh, at least 1 minus epsilon. And the statement is that the information cost of this n fold task is n times the information cost of the single task. So uh, one direction here is trivial, of course. If I want to solve the n fold task, I can always just solve n copies uh, just independently, solve each one without talking to the other copies, and that will be n times the cost. The interesting direction is showing that uh, I really need n times the information cost in order to solve the n-fold task. OK, so remember that this is an infimum over protocols, and this is also an infimum over protocols. To show this inequality, what we really need to show is that if I am able to solve the n-fold task with some information cost, then I can solve the single copy with 1 over n, the information cost. Okay, if I can show this for every protocol, then we get this inequality for the infimums. OK, so how do we do that? Let's say you give me a protocol for the n-fold task. I want to construct from it a protocol for a single copy. How are we going to do that? This is the input that the protocol that you gave me wants. It wants to run on n copies. But I only have one input that I care about. So what are we going to do? The natural thing to do is take the input that we care about and just stick it somewhere in these n copies, pick a random place, and put the single copy input there. And we know that the uh, n-fold uh, protocol is going to be solving each coordinate with marginal error probability and most epsilon. So in particular, it's going to be solving this coordinate pretty well for us. But uh, before we can run the protocol, we need to somehow complete the input. We need to 
make up uh, values for the rest of the coordinates. And we do have this input distribution mu, so what we need to do is somehow sample uh, inputs for all the other coordinates according to mu. Now, mu is not necessarily a product distribution. There can be correlation between x and y. So the players cannot just go off on their own. One player will sample x and the other player will sample y independently. That won't generate the right distribution. And in fact, our strategy will be to always have either x or y be public. And then the other player can look at that and uh, sample uh, his own input privately with the right distribution. And the only question is how to, how to actually implement this. The first thing you might try, which ends up not working, is to just do everything public. Let's just sample x and y completely publicly in everywhere except the real input. So this does generate the correct distribution, obviously. But the problem is with the information cost. And here's a bad example. So let's say my protocol, which I'm trying to simulate, um, the only thing it does, Alice takes all of her input, she XORs all of it together, and she sends this. This is a single bit. What happens? The uh, information that she conveyed about her input was just a single bit, because this is what she sent, right? So in the protocol we're generating, we need to be leaking 1 over n of a bit, because we're trying to get 1 over n the information cost. But how much are we actually leaking if everything is public? Well, if we know x in all the coordinates except i, and we know the xor of all the coordinates, of course, we also learn the value of xi. So we learned a complete bit about the input. We learned the entire input. So we're leaking too much. This is not good. Obviously, we need to be hiding parts of the input. And this is what Mark mentioned when he said that private randomness is going to be very important. We cannot do everything publicly. So uh, why don't we just do this? Okay, let's sample all of x publicly. And then Bob can sample y privately now. Right? He doesn't have to talk to Alice about that anymore. We still get the same problem that we had before. But we've made some progress, because at least now, for y, we're not leaking too much coordinates. So if you do this, you can prove that uh, actually we're not revealing too much information about y when you sample y privately. But we still have the problem for x. And you could do it, of course, the other way around, sample y publicly and uh, x privately, but then you're just switching things around. So what is the solution? Actually, just mix both of these two approaches. Do half and half. This is the solution. You need to sample about half of the coordinates from x and about half of the coordinates from y publicly. And everything that wasn't public, uh, the other player samples it privately. OK, and if you do this, then you really get the right uh, amount of information leakage. Technically, it turns out that this is the most convenient way to do it. This is our special coordinate where we put the actual input, sample everything before this coordinate, uh, sample all of x publicly there, sample all of y publicly after this coordinate. So in expectation, this will be half of the inputs for x and half of the inputs for y. Uh, this also saves you a factor of two if you actually do the math. Uh, and then it's actually, it's really easy to prove that when you do the embedding this way, you really are leaking only 1 over n, the information cost of the protocol. You're sort of testing it on one coordinate. It doesn't know where, so it's going to be leaking 1 over n, the information. Is there a question in the back? Yeah. So the choice of i is chosen Yes, i is chosen publicly. And of course, it's really important that the protocol um, pi that we're simulating doesn't know i, right? So a very stupid choice would be to fix i to be 1, for example. Always put i in the first coordinate. But then the protocol could take advantage of that and sort of always leak information just about the first coordinate. OK, so it's important to be putting it somewhere random. It doesn't know where we're looking. And that's why we'll be getting only 1 over n of the information. OK, so this is the embedding. And uh, this really completes the proof. Now we've shown that if you know how to solve the n-fold task, then you also know how to solve a single copy with only 1 over n of the information cost. Let me uh, go back to uh, why we actually wanted this. Uh, the really important question that we care about in communication complexity is, does this sort of behavior also hold for communication? If I want to solve n copies of a task, do I need to communicate n times as much? We've just shown that for information, the answer is yes. For communication, uh, we do get one side of the inequality trivially. What about the other side? Well, let's assume for a second that we were living in this really amazing world 
where every protocol could be compressed perfectly. If I give you a protocol with uh, information cost i, you could compress it so that it only communicates i. If we could do this, then we would really get uh, the other side of the inequality as well. Why? Because uh, let's pick the optimal protocol that solves the n-fold task. It has some communication complexity, which is exactly the right communication complexity for the n-fold task. And um, this is also an upper bound on its information complexity because one bit of communication is always worth at most one bit of information. So now I'm going to take this protocol. We said we can compress it uh, perfectly. Before uh, we do that, I'm going to construct a protocol for the single copy using this embedding that I just showed you. We get a protocol which has 1 over n the information cost. right? So it also has an information cost which is the communication required for n copies slashed by n. Now take this and compress it. We get, if we could do this, we would get a protocol for f with communication 1 over n. Okay, so this is this little diagram that Mark showed you before, which had three corners being exactly equal because information tensorizes perfectly. If we had perfect compression, we could complete also the other corner and get that communication tensorizes perfectly. But this is a perfect world which we don't live in. We actually cannot compress perfectly. And it's not clear how well exactly we can compress or not. All right, so for us, this is a really good reason to look at compression. How well can we compress a protocol? OK, this is interesting for its own sake, not just for this application. So to be perfectly formal, um, the, the task of compression is I'm going to give you a protocol pi. And I'll also tell you what the distribution is on the inputs. And uh, let's just denote by pi of x, y the transcript distribution of this protocol. So even when I fix the inputs, remember that I still have randomness in the protocol. So the transcript is still a distribution. I want you to sample transcripts from a distribution which is close to the correct one in statistical distance. And I want you to do this using as little communication as possible. Ideally, the communication should just be the information cost. OK, so you need to construct a protocol where Alice gets x, Bob gets y. They are somehow outputting transcripts from almost the right distribution, but they're not using a lot of communication in order to do it. So when you see this question, there is uh, one approach which seems very natural, but unfortunately doesn't work that well. And that's just to say, well, here's my protocol. It sends messages one by one. If you look at the information cost, it actually decomposes just by the chain rule into the information leaked by each message given the messages that have gone on so far. So we can try to compress it that way as well. Let's just compress every message individually. So you compress a message and you send the compressed version. And then you compress the next message and send the compressed version and so on like this. And the problem with this approach is that even if we could do this compression really, really well, we would still be paying at least one bit of communication because when you compress a message, you still end up with something, at least one bit of communication. So you'd be paying at least one bit for every round of the protocol that you need to compress. And this protocol could have a lot of rounds. Actually, the number of rounds could be completely disproportional to the information that it leaks, because it might leak just a tiny little bit of information in every round. And we saw a really good example of this in the hand raising protocol that Mark showed. Basically, when a round goes by where neither Alice nor Bob raises their hand, that's just a tiny sliver of information being leaked, much, much less than one. So if you try to compress that protocol this way, uh, it works really badly. So this is not completely useless. This is actually an approach that you uh, do use when you prove that information cost is the scaling limit of communication. Because as the number of copies goes to infinity, the fact that you're paying one per round that becomes less significant. And actually, the penalty uh, becomes negligible as the number of copies goes to infinity. But if you're just looking at the task of compressing a single shot, you don't have many copies, just one, we can't afford to pay this penalty. We need to do something better. Instead of working round by round, we somehow need to be doing a whole lot of rounds at once. 
So in the approach that I'm going to show you now, we sample the entire transcript all at once, not round by round. OK. Uh, so this is uh, the first compression scheme that we're going to see. Uh, I'm going to give you a protocol, and I'll give you a distribution. Let's denote by i the information cost of this protocol. What we want to do again, Alice gets an input x, Bob gets an input y. They want to jointly produce a transcript, which has a distribution close in statistical distance to the distribution of the transcript according to the original protocol. And I'm not going to charge them for writing out the transcript that they sampled just for the communication that they need to exchange in order to agree on the sample. OK. Uh, so let's uh, take a more detailed look at the distribution of transcript. Actually, the really important uh, structure here that protocols have is that Alice speaks, and then Bob speaks, and they sort of alternate. Neither player knows anything about the other guy's input except for what the other guy said. Because of that, we can take the uh, distribution of transcript and break it up into two parts, where one part just depends on x and one part just depends on y. How do we do this? Um, if we look at the transcript and we break it up into messages, every message is sent either by Alice or by Bob. So we can just take A, this is the part that Alice controls, Take the product of all the messages that she sends, and I'm just assuming she sends in every even round. She controls the probability that this message is sent. So given the transcript so far and given her input, she controls whether or not this message will be sent. Bob controls the odd rounds. Okay, So if you just take the product of these two, you get exactly the probability that this transcript will be generated. Okay? This fact is really, really important. It's used even in the combinatorial proofs um, that we have for communication complexity. It's not stated this way, but really this is um, crucial there. OK, so obviously only Alice knows x and only Bob knows y. So they can't both compute the product. Each one only has a little part of the complete picture, but they do have something. And also, they're able to estimate what the other guy has in mind. So what they can do, um, Bob, knowing y, has some guess about x. He can take this guess and sort of try to estimate what Alice is thinking. Right? So he samples x from its distribution given y, and then he <coughs> computes what Alice wants to do. And uh, Alice can do the same thing. She samples y from its distribution given x. And she thinks what Bob wants to do. And I'm claiming that if the information cost of the protocol is small, then they can read each other's minds really well. So actually, you don't really need to know, um, here you don't really need to know x in order to know what Alice wants to do, and vice versa. Um, so just in terms of pictures, this is a picture that will be really important for this compression scheme. Um, it's a three-dimensional picture. The axes here are the transcripts. Um, this is Alice's side of the distribution. This is her real function. This is not a distribution. It's just this uh, function controlling her part of the transcript distribution. And this is what Bob thinks about it okay, when he doesn't know x. And this is the side of the picture for Bob. This is really his part of the distribution. And this is what Alice thinks he wants to do. And they're not the same. But what I'm claiming is that if the information cost is small, then they're close. How close are they? Well, remember that this is our definition of the information cost. Let's break it up in terms of divergence. It's the expectation on x and y of the divergence between the true distribution of transcripts and what you would guess if you don't know x. Okay, plus the same term, true, the true distribution, and what you would guess if you don't know why. If you just plug in the priors into this definition, you get that it's the expectation on x, y, and transcripts of the log between the real uh, value that Alice has in mind and Bob's prior, plus the log of what Bob really has in mind and Alice's prior. Okay, so going back to the picture, what we just said right now is that if I look at the ratio between these two curves, the real one and the prior that Bob has, in expectation, the log of this ratio will be bounded by the information cost. 
This is for Alice's side. The exact same thing holds for Bob's side. The expected ratio between these two curves is bounded by the information cost, the log ratio, sorry. OK, now the term in here is, it can be negative. It's a log, right? But it's not hard to see that the contribution of the negative terms to the expectation really has to be small. So almost all the time, the, um, when you sample according to the blur blue curve, you will fall above the red curve. Because you're sampling according to the right curve, you're going to be favoring the parts where this curve is higher. Um, okay. So now we're going to use the fact that these curves are close and the other player can pretty much guess what the uh, other player wants to do in order to sample. And this is the procedure that we'll use for the sampling. This is called rejection sampling. I'm sure all of you have seen variations of it, but just to all be on the same page, let me introduce the exact variant that I want. So we have some distribution in mu. It's over a universe u, um, and we want to be sampling from this distribution. The way we'll do it is we'll look at a two-dimensional picture. We'll look at the curve of this distribution. And our sample will uh, just be throwing darts at this two-dimensional board. So you throw them uniformly, just completely at random on this board. And you pick the first dart that happened to fall under the curve of the distribution. What's the idea that you'll be favoring the parts where the distribution is higher? So this generates exactly the correct distribution. And this is the procedure we'll be using. Hey, what do you need to know about it? Um, well, first of all, for any given dart, the probability that this dart will be good for me will fall under the curve. It's just one over the universe size. Uh, so it's enough to throw something like the universe size many darts in order to have a good probability of having a good dart that I can select. And uh, we are really generating the correct distribution because given that the value of a certain dart is some element u, what's the probability that it fell under the curve? It's exactly the height of the curve at u. So this is the correct distribution. OK, so let's go back to our picture. We don't have one curve. We have two curves, right? We said that the transcript distribution is the product of these two curves. So what we're going to be doing is throwing sort of three-dimensional darts uniformly over this three-dimensional volume. Okay, so every dart will have a transcript. It will have a value on this side and also a value on this side. And we want to pick this dart if it falls under both blue curves. That will generate exactly the product of these two curves. OK? So throw a three-dimensional dart just totally uniformly at random in this volume. Pick the first one that fell under both blue curves. What's the problem? Um, Alice knows this blue curve, but she doesn't know this one. And Bob knows this curve, but he doesn't know this one. So how can they pick? the first dart that fell under both curves. This is really the heart of the compression, the, the, uh, compression <coughs> scheme. How are we going to figure out which dart is the right one? OK. So here we're going to be using the fact that we can read each other's minds. Okay, we don't know exactly which darts uh, are good for Alice and which ones are good for Bob, but we can estimate them pretty well if the information cost is low. How well can we estimate them? Let's say that this is uh, the dart that Alice likes. It's a dart that falls under her curve. Uh, Bob knows that his estimate generally tends to be too low, way too low. But we do know that the expected log ratio is i. So if we take the red curve and we scale it up by a factor of roughly 2 to the i, we'll get something that covers the blue curve almost everywhere because the expected log ratio was i. OK, so if Bob uh, scales up his estimate by 2 to the i, he will get the right darts with good probability, you know, except for parts where we might miss them, but these parts are uh, unlikely. What's the problem? That this uh, estimate is now way too high in many other areas, right? So he's going to be getting a lot of darts that Alice didn't like. And he doesn't know that because he doesn't know the blue curve. So um, we get the right dart. 
but we also get a lot of false positives, and we're going to need to be eliminating these false positives. Okay, so let's look at the false positives and see that there cannot be too many of them, so we can get rid of them. Uh, how many can there be? So um, just to uh, return to what we said before, the darts that Alice likes, she knows her part of the curve, and she wants to only pick darts that fall under the right part for her. As for Bob, she doesn't know what he wants to do, so she takes her estimate and she scales it up by 2 to the i, and she only picks starts that fall under the scaled estimate. And Bob does the symmetric thing. He knows his part. He only picks starts that falls under it. He scales up his estimate for Alice, and he picks the darts that he thinks Alice might like. Uh, remember that we said that for each dart, the probability of falling under the curve um, is just 1 over the universe size. Now I scaled the curve up by 2 to the i. So I scaled up the probability of falling under the curve also by 2 to the i. Okay, so for any given dart, the probability of falling under the scaled curve is 2 to the i over the size of the universe. But the total number of darts that we threw was roughly the size of the universe. Okay, so the total number of things that fall under the scaled curve in expectation will still be something like 2 to the i. Not that many false positives. So uh, now we're going to rule them out. So we have the set of darts Alice likes and the set of darts Bob likes. And we're trying to find a dart that both of them like. Because this is a dart that falls under both blue curves, under both of the true curves. How do we do that? One bad approach to take would be to say, Alice, just take all your darts and send them to Bob. And then Bob can pick one that also falls in his set. Okay, but the problem is that representing a dart takes a lot of bits, because this is the universe of all possible transcripts. Remember that every dart represents a transcript, and we're trying to compress communication. We don't want to be writing out entire transcripts, and we definitely don't want to be writing two to the i many transcripts. So what we're going to do is just hash down. Instead of writing the entire transcript, I'll just hash it down. Um, and and uh, again, remember that the sets are not too big. so. Uh, Alice just writes for the first transcript uh, this many hashes, roughly i hashes, and for the second one a different set of i hashes, and so on. She sends them to Bob, and then Bob just sees, is there some element that he has in his set which matches all the hashes that Alice sent for one of her elements? So he says, OK, this is the first dart I like. Does it match Alice's first dart? No. Does it match her second dart? And so on. The probability of matching falsely between darts is something like 2 to the minus i. And we only have 2 to the i different darts. OK, so we can control with a union bound the probability of getting a false match. Um, so, so this is really uh, the entire compression scheme. You throw these darts. Alice picks roughly 2 to the i darts, which she knows are good for her. She thinks they're good for Bob. Bob does the same thing. We have a large pool of candidates. And we find an intersection by just sending hashes of the candidates until we find one that both players agree is good. Let's do a little bit of accounting. How much did we pay for this? Well, we said that there's only roughly 2 to the i many candidates. For each one, we only needed to send about i hashes to control the error probability. So it's still 2 to the, two to the i communication from the side of Alice. Bob has an easier job. He gets these hashes. He just needs to find the intersection and tell Alice this is what it is. So he needs to send her the index of the, the dart that he likes. OK, so it's just an index uh, from a set that's about 2 to the i uh, many elements. It's just roughly i bits of communication. And this is the entire compression scheme. And I ignored everywhere all the error terms. So I am just assuming a constant probability of error here. If you want a smaller probability of error, you need to be a little bit more careful. But I'm just ignoring it for now. So are there any questions about this compression scheme? Because I've shown you all of it now. All right, good. Um, this is not great, right? We just compressed to 2 to the i, okay? 2 to the information cost. And why did that happen? It's because we're sort of treating transcripts as this monolithic thing. We're, we're sampling an entire transcript all at once. 
and we're ignoring the interaction. We're ignoring the fact that uh, maybe something more fine-grained is going on. First, Alice says something that completely changes Bob's prior about what she wants to say, and so on. We're not sort of updating our priors as we go along. And here's a, an example that shows what can go wrong. It's a very easy example. Let's say that Alice and Bob both get uniform uh, vectors from uh, binary vectors of length n. The protocol is, in every even round, Alice sends the next bit from our input, and then Bob responds with a bit from his input, and they just go back and forth. These are the curves that we get for this protocol. Alice knows x, so she knows exactly what messages she's going to send. This is a deterministic protocol. All the mass is concentrated exactly on the transcript where uh, x matches her input. And the same happens for Bob. He just wants to say y. But Alice has no idea what Bob wants to say. So her prior is just spread all over the place. And the same happens for Bob. So when we throw the darts, they're just going to be completely scattered here. And we'll be wasting a lot of effort in directions that the protocol will never go. If we just had a little bit of interaction, for example, if Alice said x1 first, we could prune out half of the space immediately. Okay, so interaction is going to be really helpful in getting better compression than 2 to the i. Uh, so what is this good for if it's so bad? Well, it still is good if your information cost is really small. Even if your uh, information cost uh, for the entire protocol is not small, but it somehow behaves manageably, you can still use this. So let's say my protocol is somehow predictable. I know that every five bits of communication, the players will be leaking one bit of information then I can chop the protocol up into five bits of communication, the next five bits of communication, and so on. And I can compress each chunk individually. Okay, so if we were somehow able to take a protocol and chop it up into bits that leak only a constant amount of information, we could use this 2 to the i compression to get really perfect compression. Um, unfortunately, we, it turns out that we can't do this chopping up. Um, but this points you towards what will be hard instances for compression. They won't be the instances where the information leaks at a constant and predictable rate. They will be instances where nothing interesting is happening. All of a sudden, information is released in a burst. And then for a long time, nothing else happens. And more information is revealed, and so on. Those are the protocols that are hard to compress. OK. Um, OK, so I did mention that perfect compression is not possible. And even worse, it turns out that 2 to the i is the best that you can do in some settings. OK, so if you really want compression that's completely independent of the communication of the original protocol, you can't do any better than 2 to the i. Uh, I'll show you a really recent counterexample by Gernot, Kohl, and Raz. Uh, they did have a counterexample also from last year, which is a little bit more complicated, um, but has a, maybe a stronger statement. So what they show in this counterexample, there is a task. It's not going to be a function. It's going to be some sampling task. Um, you can always solve it with i bits of information, where i is a parameter. But you cannot solve it with 2 to the i, or less than 2 to the i bits of communication for some special distribution, which will be hard. So here is the task. They call it the hidden layers game. Uh, the task will be for the players to generate some very, very long string. Okay, the length of the string will be this capital N, and it will be huge. Uh, Alice gets a special index into the string and a constraint saying, uh, for every possible history, k here is the alphabet for the string. If the first two a plus one <coughs> symbols are this, the next symbol needs to be that. Okay, so it's a mapping from every possible prefix to what the next symbol needs to be. And Bob gets another constraint. Okay, Alice's constraint is for even indices. There's some even index which she really cares about. For Bob, there's some odd index which he really cares about. And he needs to be generating some uh, symbol for that position. And the goal is to generate some string that satisfies both constraints. So in position 
2a plus 1, Alice needs to apply her constraint. Whatever happened to be generated before, she needs to generate the next symbol correctly. And the same for Bob, he needs to generate the next symbol correctly. They somehow need to be satisfying both constraints at the same time. Uh, so I haven't <coughs> told you what the distribution is on the inputs. I'll get back to that later. Uh, the interesting feature of this task is that no matter what the distribution is, you can solve it with low information. But there is one distribution that has high communication. Okay, so I'll talk first about the low information part. And for that, we don't need to know what the distribution is. Take any distribution, distribution that you want. OK, so here's the protocol. We're just going to be generating the string symbol by symbol. We know that uh, Alice is the one who cares about, after we've seen an even number of symbols, what happens in the next symbol. So she'll be controlling the generation of odd symbols. Uh, whenever we have an odd symbol to generate, Alice will generate it. Uh, if it's the one that she cares about, she'll apply her constraint and generate the right symbol there. If it's one that she doesn't care about, she just generates something completely uniformly random. And the same for Bob. Uh, he controls, oh, sorry, this should be even. He controls uh, the even symbols. He applies this constraint in the right place. Everywhere else, just totally uniform. OK, so we are generating a string which satisfies both constraints. But what did we learn from this process? It's easy to see that we didn't reveal the special indices. OK, the distribution just is completely uniform. And you learn nothing about the index that the players really cared about. Um, so what did you learn? You learned something very diffuse over this entire string. You learned something like, if this was the place that the other player cared about, then he applied the correct constraint and we got the right symbol. But you don't know where the constraint was applied. So there's very little information there. It's something like, you know, there's n symbols. For each one, you learn the value of the constraint, which is worth log k bits, because the alphabet is of size k. But you don't know where it was, so it's divided by n. Another way to see this is just by calculating the divergence. If you take a random string, it has probability uh, 1 over k of satisfying the constraint, because the constraint says one symbol from an alphabet of k needs to be here. So it's 1 over k. right? So the prior distribution is just all strings are uh, the same likelihood. The posterior distribution rules out. you know, It just leaves 1 over k. So the divergence is log k. Uh, OK, and Bob also learned the same thing. So the total uh, information cost is just 2 log k. And now I want to claim that if you want to solve this task, you need k bits of communication for some distribution. And we'll see what the considerations are for designing this distribution. Uh, so here's some approaches that a lower bound is going to need to rule out if we want to show that this is hard. So these are approaches that get somewhat good communication complexity. Uh, the first one says the following. These are the constraints that we had. And remember that all the constraint says is in some particular location, some symbol from an alphabet of size k needs to appear. So like we said, if I give you a random string, there's a probability of 1 over k that it satisfies this constraint. And there's also a probability 1 over k that it satisfies this constraint. If we take the constraints to be independent, there's the probability of 1 over k squared that it's good for both. So if we want to generate a string that satisfies both constraints, let's just generate a whole lot of strings at random and pick one that's good for both of us. So we'll generate uh, something like k squared strings so that we, we know that there will be a good one in there. Um, Alice likes 1 over k of the random strings, so she likes about k of them. Bob also likes about k of them. How do we find one that's good for both? Just take the intersection of the ones that Alice likes and the ones that Bob likes. So we're back to a disjointness instance. The size of the sets is k. So you need exactly k bits of communication to find an intersection. So this is good for us because I wanted to get an exponential separation. We saw that the information was log k. Here's a somewhat clever approach, but it still gets communication of k. Not bad so far. But let's see another approach, which might be better. Let's say that we somehow magically 
uh, we don't know if A is bigger than B, but let's say we were able to figure this out and also somehow separate them. Somehow find a number C that falls between them. So this is the picture. Maybe in this particular case, um, B happens to fall before A, right? But we're able to find some C that falls between them. This is really battery here is ending. What could we do in this case? We know that Bob cares about something in the first part. Alice cares about something in the second part. They don't need to interfere with each other because Alice doesn't care at all what Bob does in the first part. So we can use this separation to say, well, just have Bob pick the first part of the string because he cares about it. So let's take a pool of uh, k random strings, and Bob will tell us which one is good for his constraint. And now that will be the first part. Then we move over to Alice. Uh, we also let her pick a random string, uh, which is good for her. And again, we only need k, a pool of k random strings to find one that is good. So having Bob tell Alice, this is a string that I like, that's just log k bits of information. And then Alice says, OK, this is the second part that I like. That's also log k bits of information. So the only thing that might be hard here is finding the C which separates A and B. We need to make sure that this really is hard. Because so far, we just have log k bits of communication. That's too good. So how hard is it to find to, to separate two numbers? Um, so in order to make sure that this is hard, we'll have a tricky distribution on A and B. If you just pick them uniformly at random, it actually would be really easy to separate them. Because we know that finding a place where they're different is really easy. Just pick a random index with probability 1 half they're different. So you want to be doing something a little bit more careful. And actually, what we'll do is pick a uniform index, set them to be the same up to this index. In this index, one of them will have 0, and the other one will have 1. So they differ exactly in this index. And everything else is just random. So with this distribution, really the only thing you can do to separate the two strings is a sort of binary search where you're looking for this index that I hid in which they're different. Okay, so you sort of do a binary search, always hashing to check, are they different yet? Are they different yet? And so on. And um, so this is what it looks like. Let's say these are the two numbers that I had. This is the first index where they differ. And now I want to output some number that separates them. I'll just take the common prefix. OK, so after this common prefix, I know that one of the numbers has 1 and the other one has 0. If I output 1 followed by zeros, I'm guaranteed that I get something that's uh, no bigger than the larger number and no smaller than the smaller number. So I'm getting some number in between. OK, what is the communication cost? This is a binary search. It's a clever binary search. Okay, So if you do this the naive way, you would say, how do I check if they're equal so far? I solve equality. Equality is log. Okay, So that's maybe expensive. But it turns out you can do a noisy search with some probability of error. So just use a constant uh, number of bits at each step. And uh, you have, um, th this is a binary search. So the number of steps is the log of the representation size which is itself log n. So the cost of this binary search will be log log n. Right? And we wanted to get an uh, a communication complexity lower bound of at least k. So we'll set n to be huge. It will be 2 to the 2 to the k. And then we are able to also rule out this approach. So everything I just said is hand waving. These are two approaches. A uh, protocol doesn't have to use either one. It can combine them. It can ignore them or do whatever it wants. The really clever lower bound that GKR shows is somehow saying implicitly any protocol that you design needs to be doing one of these two things. If it's not doing them, it's not going to work. This is a really uh, nice argument. It says that if you have way too little communication, you're sort of not doing this and not doing that, and you're just not doing well. You cannot figure out which strings satisfy both constraints and which ones can't. Okay. Um, so what's uh, the, the sort of disadvantage of this example? It shows you an exponential separation. We showed exponential compression as well. So you can't hope for a bigger separation. This is the right separation. The, the drawback is that this example is huge. Okay, the string length was 2 to the 2 to the k. But the input was even bigger than that. 
because the input was this mapping from every possible prefix to the value that needs to appear. So it's like two to the two to the two to the k, right? It's, it's really, really huge. Um, and, and we don't know so far of examples that are really tight in terms of the input size. The only examples we have are something like doubly exponential at least in, in really the information cost. So that's a big open problem. Right? Conceivably, it could be that if your problem has input size n, you can somehow solve it in log n, always. We don't know. All right, so let me conclude this part of the tutorial. Uh, we proved the additivity for mutual information, that's in, that for information cost, sorry, that information tensorizes. This helps us to prove that information cost really is the right characterization in terms of the limit. But it's also nice just in and of itself. Remember that uh, communication complexity is this really useful tool for proving lower bounds. And information complexity is a lower bound in communication complexity. Okay, so the fact that information breaks up nicely into small pieces helps you to prove lower bound. For example, if you want to prove a lower bound on destroyness, we saw that it's enough to prove a lower bound on a much simpler thing, just and. And then you get n times the lower bound for disjointness. And let me just point out that disjointness is sort of the poster child of communication complexity. Somehow in every variant of disjointness that you look at, it turns out you, you need somehow new ideas in order to prove the right lower bound. And uh, for us, for multiplayer disjointness, it turned out that the right idea really was using this. Okay, so we were able to use exactly this feature to prove the right lower bound for multiplayer disjointness. Uh, then we saw that if we had perfect compression, this would be equivalent to direct sum for communication complexity, but we don't have it. So it doesn't hold. We don't know how badly it breaks, actually. Okay, so uh, because of this feature that uh, the, the counter examples are really huge, uh, we don't know how badly direct sum is violated. It could just be violated by log n. We don't know. But the perfect direct sum doesn't hold. And we saw that we can compress to exactly 2 to the i. OK, so um, at this point, direct sum for communication complexity doesn't hold. But we'd still get really amazing applications if it turned out that it scales as, let's say, n over log n, where n is the number of copies. OK, so there is still some hope of doing something interesting here. And this is open. We don't know what the right answer is. OK, so this is a good point uh, for questions. And if not, are we going to do a break? Yeah. 11.22. Um, yeah. OK. So any questions? Yeah. At the beginning, you did mention that you can drop the uh, common <coughs> shared random test. Uh, but then in your, uh, your expressions for the, for the information complexity, I didn't even see that private random test. Yes. Uh, that's a really good point. So in Mark's uh, uh, part of the talk, he defined information cost as what Alice learns about x given public and private randomness, and the same for Bob. But it turns out that you can just drop the private randomness from this expression, and it stays the same. And intuitively, the reason is, what does Alice learn about Bob's input condition on her private randomness? Her randomness has nothing to do with Bob's input. OK, so if I have it there, if I don't have it there, it doesn't matter in terms of what she learns. This is hand-waving. You need to go and prove it, but it's a very easy proof. OK, just show that uh, round by round, the information cost stays the same if you drop the randomness or not. But uh, good catch there. Other questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, OK, so we've been lying to you. This is true. Direct sum, as we presented it, says you need to be solving n copies, each one with marginal error probability at most epsilon. If we took direct sum and applied it to and, you would get that you need to solve n copies of n. And really, your output should be a vector of length n. But the strainness has one bit of output. So how do we settle this contradiction? The answer is that there's a trick, and this is something that Mark alluded to in his talk. He said that we look at distributions where the probability of getting 1, 1 is 0. If you look at a distribution like this and you do the embedding that I showed, the OR will be 0 everywhere except the input that I plugged in. Okay, the input 
so, so the value of disjointness will just be the value of and on this input. OK, so uh, in order to show a lower bound for disjointness, you have to work with a distribution that gives no support to 1, 1. And this is a little bit tricky, because why should and be hard if I know that 1, 1 is never going to happen? I know that the answer is going to be 0. Seems like that should be an easy task. The answer is you work with worst case communication complexity. So you force the protocol to always be right, even on inputs that are not supported. And then you measure the information complexity with respect to this distribution. OK, but this is uh, a trick, a little bit of a nest trick. And we actually find that it's sort of impeding our progress. Uh, if you try to generalize this to three-party disjointness and so on, this is exactly the issue that you run into. OK, any other sharp-eyed audience member catch me in a lie? Good job, because uh, I did uh, pull a few on you. All right, so we'll uh, continue at 11.22. Uh,